hanging here on a tree on dark Calvary. There's a man hanging by my side on the blow of him bound as his blood falls to the ground from the stripes crown of thorns that he wears not long ago my voice was heard mingled with those scorning words as I mocked his holy name and in some amazing way grace then gave strength to say when thou comest into thy kingdom O Lord remember me tell me what did he ever ever see in me my yesterdays are in shambles that graves my destiny and this my soul through endless ages, throughout all eternity. Tell me what did he ever see in me? The King of all eternity, he then turned and looked at me. And I thought, how foolish can I be? Lord, I could never work for Thee, for I am nailed to this old tree, and my past is filled with misery and shame. I can't believe those words I hear falling down upon my ear, a display of grace so full and Floods of joy now fill my eyes as I hear these words to my surprise. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Tell me what did he ever, ever see in me, my yesterday? Days are in shambles that graves my destiny, and this my soul through endless ages, throughout all eternity. Tell me what did he ever see in me, and this my soul through endless ages. Throughout all eternity, oh, tell me what did he ever see in me? All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's been good this morning, amen? I mean, glad you saved, say amen. I'll tell you something, that's better than religion, it's having a relationship with a living God. I talked to him this morning, he's still on the throne, and he's still doing well, amen, and I hope you are too, amen, what a blessing, I tell you what, I know I'm the only thing that stands between you and uh, a special lunch, uh, we're having ham, I hadn't figured that out why we have ham, I asked my wife earlier this morning, I said, won't we have rabbit, I said, you don't have rabbit, you don't eat rabbit on Easter, I said, okay, all right, I, I, I just don't know where the ham came from, amen, but anyway, I'll eat chicken. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but I knew I was called to preach when I had a craving for chicken, amen, but anyway, um, I, it's called the gospel bird, it's such a, such a wonderful thing, but I appreciate the uh, uh, ladies cooking for the Hurley family, uh, she, they just got home from uh, the death of their mom in Kentucky, so you pray for them, they're probably watching by way of uh, internet, and I appreciate that good port loin, Miss Leslie, and appreciate all the trimmings and good desserts. Uh, we like to uh, make folks uh, not have to cook 
during times of grief, and that's part of the ministry of the church. Well, I got a lot of people to baptize this morning. Matter of fact, we're trying to find some more robes, and uh, I don't know if we can go up to the dollar store and buy a couple, but anyway, it's a blessing to have that problem, and we're, we're excited about probably more people baptized on this Easter Sunday than we had in a long, long time. Amen. I thank God for that. And uh, that's wonderful. People have been saved, and they want to get scripturally baptized. Baptism doesn't save us. the blood of Jesus that saves us, but we picture it to a lost and dying world, and we tell the Lord we want to be obedient. He said, be baptized, be baptized. Amen. And I'm Baptist by conviction because of that. We need to be uh, not uh, baptizing babies, but we ought to baptize believers. Amen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll try to be brief this morning. But I'm going to continue tonight, so I hope you'll come back. I'm really excited about the message tonight. I almost flip-flopped it and preached it this morning because it's seven irrefutable evidences of the resurrection. You've got to come back, please, 6 o'clock and 5.30 prayer meeting. Let's stay in all the Word of God. I'm going to read the entire chapter, not really. I'm just going to read a few verses, and then you'll be seated. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I want you to underline that word gospel. Without the go in it, it's just a spell. It says, and to you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you received, and therein ye stand. And which also ye are saved. Say that word with me. Saved. If you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered you first of all that I also received, uh, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to this present, but some are fallen asleep or died. And after that he was seen in, of James and of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me. Paul saying that also as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, saved, amen. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now let me read you the text for tonight. It says, Now if Christ uh, be preached that He arose from the dead, how, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so, be that the dead rise not. And if Christ rise not, then he is not Christ, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. And here's the phrase I want to give you. And ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perish. In other words, they went to hell, never will go to heaven. And is this life only we have hope in Christ? Thank you, choir. We are of all men most miserable. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the great choir specials, and thank you, God, for the special uh, that Brother Randy sang and the hymns and all that we do to celebrate on Sunday the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, help us, Lord, as we try to preach this message in the few minutes we have. Uh, God, uh, on the good news of, of the resurrection. And God, thank you for the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you'd use the gospel as a power unto salvation. There would be one that's not saved here, that they get saved this morning. Lord, this would be a great day for them to uh, write in their Bible that they got saved. But it would be a great day to have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That they're saved, saved, saved. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you ever got some good news? Amen. I'll never forget the time that... Uh, my wife told me that we were having a baby, and uh, well, she was really having the baby, but I felt like I was with her, amen, and, uh, and I remember we fell down on our knees next to the coffee table, and we thanked God and claimed a boy, 
And that was our assistant pastor. He was eight months old when we came to town. That tells you how old I am and how old he is. He's about 42 or so. And uh, thank God uh, for that good news. Amen. Then we had the good news that we was going to have another little girl. And then we had the good news, last but not least, that we was going to have twins. And I named them Stop and No More. Amen. No. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was a double blessing. Amen. Have, have you ever had good news? I've been sitting in... Uh, uh, surgery rooms, or excuse me, not in surgery rooms because I'm not that talented uh, and I'm not called, but I've been in waiting rooms a long time and we'd wait and we'd wait and we'd wait and we'd wait and then the doctor would come out and finally he'd say, we got good news and boy, we'd all perk up, we'd stand up, we'd lean forward to see what the doctor said. I want to say, friend, good news is good news, but I want to say this, good news is not good news unless there's some bad news sometimes and folks, I want to give you the bad news and the good news of the gospel or the death, burial, and resurrection. And folks, I believe the opposite of good news is bad news. Sometimes we uh, expect bad news and God gives us good news. But I want to tell you something, friend. The best news I've ever heard was that you can get saved. That you can be saved not by works, lest we'd boast about it. Not by joining the church, getting baptized, capsized, or simonized. But I'm telling you, friend, we're saved by the grace of God and the power of the death burial, and resurrection, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you, first of all, uh, the bad news is found in verse 1. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye are stand, which ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, lest ye believe in vain. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. I want you to look at the two words, our sins. Here's some bad news. The bad news is we're all sinners. The bad news is we, sin, we inherit in this uh, sinful, Adamic nature from our great-great-grandparents, Adam and Eve. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And here's even worse news. You can't pay enough ritual. You can't pay enough religion. You can't pay enough good works to get yourself out of under the sin debt of, of, of sin, and that's death, for the wage of sin is death. But here's the great news, and it's good news, and folks, I believe, as I said, sometimes uh, good news is even better when you think about the bad news that it could be. The bad news is that we're all sinners, and the bad news is if we don't get saved, we're going to hell forever and ever and ever, but the good news is you don't have to. Amen? Praise God, the good news is there's a way out. Amen. Uh, Dr. Roland Laville, many years ago, said one day the War Department called him and said, are you min uh, the minister to thus and such a lady? And he said, yes, I am. He said, well, listen, we got to have you, uh, your help. Uh, he said, we notified them a couple of weeks ago that her son had died in the service. And, but he, we found out that he's alive. And now could you send somebody from... Uh, we could send somebody from the army, but we're afraid we wouldn't know how to say it right. And uh, the pastor said, well, I'll be glad to go. And he went to the door, knocked on the door, and he said, I've got some good news for you. Your son is not dead. Your son is alive. Now, can you imagine the celebration? Can you imagine the elation? Can you imagine an extra supper served or, praise God, a party pitched or whatever before that good news? But it was, it was good news because it had been accompanied with bad news. The bad news is we've all fallen short of the glory of God, but the good news is God did not fall short when He provided a way for us to be saved. Let me just give you the good news, first of all, of the gospel. Amen. The death, the burial, and resurrection. Look at verse 3. It says, For I delivered unto you first of all which I have received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I want you to see, first of all, folks, the good news is it's that uh, the, the, the gospel, the way out, salvation, is sacrificially provided. Amen? And folks, He said here, for I, I, I want to say this, I want to deliver to you first of all. That's not the first thing He said, it's just the most important thing He'd say. First of all, most important of all, I want to tell you that there's a gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, amen, whereby you can be saved. He died for our 
sin. Amen? And the only sin that will send you to hell is the sin of unbelief. Sin, first of all, is a debt. That's bad news. The bad news is you can't pay it. There's no way in the world heaven has sued you for the damages and you cannot pay it. Your good works cannot pay it. Your religion cannot pay it. There's nothing on this earth that can pay for your sin debt. But Jesus paid it all. And Jesus is the Lamb of God. And then beyond the sin being a debt, sin is a defilement. Sin is not only what we owe, sin is what we are. We are sinners defiled by nature. We have a sinful nature. Nobody had to teach you to do wrong. You started doing wrong, amen? As a baby, you cried when there was nothing wrong, amen? Uh, you pouted as a teenager when nothing was wrong. And Folks, listen, I'm going to tell you something, folks. We are defiled by nature. We have a sinful nature. That's why uh, when David got right with God in Psalms 51, he said, you've conceived me in iniquity. He's not saying that he was... Uh, illegitimate son, he was saying, I have a sinful nature and I want to confess that. So sin is defilement. And so folks, the bad news is sin is a debt, sin is a defilement, but also sin has a dominion. We become slaves of sin. What does the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ do? It deals in all three areas of that sin. The sin debt, the sin penalty, the sin power, and even the sin presence. I thank God, folks, it deals with the full payment of the debt. His death paid the debt. It's finished, he said. Teletasia, on the uh, bills of the Bible days, they stamped it with that word. Latin equivalent is consummatum. It means paid in full. When he said, it is finished, he was saying it's paid. It's paid. Not I'm finished. Not the word's finished. Not even the work of the Calvary's finished. He was saying, folks, listen, the debt has been paid, praise God, and the work of Calvary has been finished. And there's nobody else that needs to die for you. There's nobody else that could die for you. And then I want you to see, uh, folks, it's an offering for sin. 743 years before, and I'll get to a lot of prophecy in just a minute because I believe that helps us believe. Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 a wonderful thing. In verse 10, he said this, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. The greatest altar and the greatest offering has ever been made was at Calvary when our Lamb, the G Jesus Christ, and he says, and you shall, listen, you shall, you shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days, there's the resurrection, and the pleasure of the Lord shall be prospering in his hand. So folks, the Bible compares Calvary to a sin offering. And the only offering that's good enough was the perfect Lamb of God. For the wage of sin is death, and somebody had to die, and Jesus took your debt. Jesus took your death. Jesus took your hell. You want to look at a terrible picture of hell? Look at the darkness of Calvary. Look at the loneliness of Calvary. Look at the suffering of Calvary. That's what's going to go on forever and ever and ever in a place, a Christless place, a lonely place, a dark place called hell. But Jesus took your hell for you. Amen. amen. I'm glad he picked up the debt. I'm glad he paid it all, amen, because I could never pay it all. Not only proves that he died, burial, uh, it, pr it proves that he was dead. But it also proves that by the burial that he buried your sins in the sea of forgetfulness, never to go fishing again, say amen. In the Bible days, they had uh, several uh, ceremonies or, or sacrifices, and they'd put a bird in a in a jar and bury it, and then they would have uh, some time, that looked, and that was the resurrection, and run water over it, and all kinds of symbolism. Then they also had where they would confess sin over a, a goat, and, and, and shoo it off into the wilderness as a scapegoat. And folks, that's exactly what our sins have been, been shooed away. It's been, it's been uh, cast as far as the east is from the west. I'm forgiven because Jesus took my sin for me, and God treated Jesus as if He did it. And so He can forgive me. He delivers us from the pollution and the corruption of sin. A man was freed from prison, but he wasn't happy. He, he, uh, he opened up his t-shirt and showed the, the people because they asked him why he wasn't smiling. He was happy. And he was ate up with cancer. And folks, listen, he was freed from the, 
uh, penalty of sin, but he wasn't freed from the pollution and the defilement of sin. Folks, I want to tell you something. When Jesus saves you, he saves you uh, by his death from the dead of sin. But he also saves you by his burial from the, from the, uh, de- uh, the, the defilement of sin. And he gives you a new nature, a holy nature, a nature that will love God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, but all things become new. He gives you a new want to. He gives you a new desire. He gives you power and peace. And, and folks, listen, He gives you a, a, a preeminent plan for your life. And that's to please God and not man and not yourself. And definitely not live in sin, but live for a Savior. There's a transformation, praise God. The blood of Jesus not only pardons uh, from prison, but it, 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 it pardons from the poison of sin. And then last but not least, Jesus dealt with the dominion of sin. The resurrection. His resurrection deals with the dominion of sin. Folks, he's living. He's ever living. He's alive right now. That's why we're going to have a prayer meeting at 530. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need. He'll hear you because he's alive. I'm not, hey, listen, I'm not praying to some statue. And I'll tell you this, I ain't praying to no man or lady. I'm praying to God when I pray through Jesus Christ. By His blood, I have access. And by His Spirit, I'm escorted into the presence of God. Prayer's real. And prayer uh, uh, brings uh, miracles because He's alive. But I want you to see this word study in verse 4. It says, and that He was buried. The word buried is in the aorist tense. That means He was buried once. And that he, uh, and, and then back in uh, verse 3, it says He died. That's aorist tense again. He died one time. He didn't have to die many times. But look at verse 4, and it says that he was buried and that he rose again. The word rose is in the, uh, is in the present tense. That means he's always going to be alive. You can't, you can't leave home without him, amen? He's everywhere, praise God. He's in the surgery room. He's in the hospital room this morning. Uh, he's, he's in the jail cell. He's wherever there's a believer because a believer brings the Spirit of God with him. Now, He's not in this building until you walk in it. Amen. The Holy Spirit doesn't uh, tabernacle in buildings made of man. He tabernacles in you. And I want to tell you something, folks. It's called the Spirit of the Resurrection. It's powerful. Praise God. I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad that I have a relationship with a powerful God. And so, folks, it was sacrificially proved. According to the text, the good news was brought to us through Jesus Christ, folks, as a sacrifice provided. Second of all, it was scripturally prophesied. It was scripturally prophesied. The good news. I'm talking about the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection. The good news was scripturally prophesied. Look at verse 3. It says this, and according to the scripture. Look at verse 4. It says, and according to the scripture. That he died, that he was buried, that he rose according to the Scripture. Now my question is, friend, what Scripture? Well, the New Testament wasn't written when uh, Jesus was saying this and Paul was recording it. It's the Old Testament. And I want to tell you something, the main message of the Bible is God, from Genesis to Revelation. But the main message from Genesis to Revelation is the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. But the main message of the whole Bible is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you just a couple of prophecies. In Zechariah chapter 13, that's right before Malachi, I'm sure you can find it, right before Malachi, Zechariah 13, I want you to look at uh, verse 7. The Bible says this, Awake, O sword, against thy shepherd, and against the man that is, fe- is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. If you look at Mark chapter 14, 50, when the Lord was crucified, there wasn't a crowd, there was just a few ladies and one man, and folks, they were scattered. And that's that's uh, prophesied and fulfilled in Mark chapter 14, 50. They said they all forsook him and fled. In Psalms 35, verse 11, <clears throat> the Bible says he'd be falsely accused. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 60, he was falsely accused and put in uh, three trials, unjust trials. Look at Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, please. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. The Bible says, don't you love the Bible? Say amen. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 
uh, 50 and verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. That's 713 years before the fact. Isaiah saw Calvary. Saw the smiting and the spit. The beard ripped from his face. He saw the pierced side. And folks, the Bible fulfilled it exactly, or he fulfilled it exactly in Matthew chapter 26. Turn there. Matthew chapter 26. And I want you to look at verse 67. Matthew chapter 26, verse 60, uh, excuse me, 67. Matthew 26, 67. And it says, And they did spit in his face, and they buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us. Thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? I'm telling you, friend, some 713 years before the fact, here it's saying he'll be horribly abused. He'll be scourged with the cat of nine tails. Most men died from that. He'll be put on a cross, humiliated, stripped, spit upon, beat beyond recognition. The Bible says in Isaiah 52, and folks, that's exactly what happened. Now, I believe the Bible. I believe 1,500 years, 44 different authors, and 66 different books, and not one contradiction. I believe this Bible. And folks, the Bible says the gospel is according to the Scripture. According to the Scripture. Let me give you just a couple more. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. But Luke chapter 32, 23, verse 34 says, When he did open his mouth, he said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, what forgiveness? Psalms 34, verse 20 says, None of his bones will be broken. In John chapter 19, verse 33, When they came to break his legs, so it suffocated in the fluid in his lungs, and not come on the Sabbath day, he was already given up the ghost. He is already dead. Zechariah 12, verse 10 says, His body would be pierced. John chapter 19, verse 34 says, They pierced his side, and blood and water ran out. Psalms 22, verse 18 said they'll gamble for his robe. And John 19, verse 23 and 24, it's exactly what they did. They gambled at the foot of the cross. Isaiah 53, verse 10, though, says this, that Jesus would rise from the dead. Look at that again. Isaiah 53, verse 10. I'm talking about many hundreds of years before Jesus ever was born. In Isaiah 53, 10, it says, His soul will be an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. That's you, justify many, and he shall prolong his days. Thank God up from the grave he arose, and thousands, hundreds of years before the fact, it was scripturally prophesied. And then third of all, and last but not least, and y'all can't believe that really, but last but not least, in closing, the good news is solidly proven. Look at chapter 15, verse 5 through 8, and I'll try to close. We usually don't close at 12 o'clock, but we don't keep you here to one. But look at this. We've got a lot of people baptized, so I'm going to get right to the chase. But look, at, look at this. Now, I want you to look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians, our text, verse, chapter 15, verse 5. Verse 5. And tonight I'm going to elaborate on this, and I'm going to give you some, uh, some things from Josias, the historian, and other people, uh, other historians to tell you exactly that Jesus is real, that He was right, that He did die, that He did arise from the grave. Amen? Some of you skeptics need to come back at six. Really, you need to come back at six. And some of you, when the devil shoots that dart of doubt, and that dart of atheism, you need to come back at six and get the the facts. Just get the facts. But I want you to see in verse 5 something beautiful. And He was seen of Peter or Cephas, and then of the twelve. And look at this, after that he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of the whom the greater part remain unto this present, they were still alive when he was writing this, yet some have fallen asleep or died. And so folks, listen, I want to tell you something, in a court of law it only takes two witnesses. I see 500, I see one, I see 12. I see a lot of witnesses. In 40 days, folks, he appeared to Peter, the 12, James, and then 500 people at once. Some people say, well, they all had a hallucination. You don't have 500 people hallucinating at the same time. 
Can I preach that truth tonight, this morning, amen? They're not all hallucinating. My word. Men do not willingly die for a lie. And folks, these men left that scene and they gave their life for Jesus who is alive. I've never heard of anybody dying for somebody dead. I've never heard of anybody dying for a hypocrite. I've never heard of anybody dying for a lie. But I want to tell you something, friend. Many, many died, laid their lives down. 30,000 people were crucified in Jerusalem by the Roman Empire. Why? Because of a lie? Because of a great cover-up? Matthew 28, we'll go over that tonight. No, friend, they saw him. They heard him. They felt his breath upon them at the Lord's. Folks, listen, they, know, they knew he was alive and they were willing to give their life. That's the greatest proof of the resurrection. Amen. To change cowards like Peter into a powerful preacher that on day of Pentecost stood and said, You've crucified the Lord, you bunch of Jews. He said, But you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And 3,000 of them got saved that day. He's alive. To change. Denying coward named Peter into a powerful, courageous preacher that would preach a message like Acts chapter 2, he's alive. He's alive. The Bible proves he's alive. We just gave you many prophecies, but folks, there's manuscript after manuscript after manuscript of the Bible being real. Brother Jeremy will go over that over, over a new life in a few days and come back here and do it in a few months. But I want to say this, friend. I believe I hold in my hand the alive Word of God. And it's recorded all through the Scriptures. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. And it's a proven fact, say amen. amen. The founder of the Harvard School of Law, Dr. Simon Greenleaf. He was called by a student of law, one of the greatest law professors who ever lived. And he was a founder of the Harvard Law School, and he died in 1853. Before he died, he wrote a book called A Treatise on the Law of Evidence. And he studied in the law school, uh, he studied the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what he said in his own words concerning the testimony of the apostles. It was impossible that they could have persisted in affirming the truth that they narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead. Here's one of the greatest lawyers that ever lived. He wrote a book on the law of evidence. And he said, there is no way that these disciples over and over again, and even given their life, could have lied and could have went with this narrative if Jesus had not actually risen from the dead. Amen. I don't need a lawyer. i got God. And God tells me He is alive. My question is, is He alive in you? And that brings me to my final point. I told you I was closing. I love to close and close. There's the good news, the gospel has saving power. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, good news, which I preach to you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Look at verse 2. By which also you are, say it with me, class, saved, if you keep in memory that I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Folks, you haven't believed in vain if you believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I love Romans 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, if you, ought, you ought to confess with your mouth when you get saved. Amen. And you ought to believe in your heart, what? That God has raised Him from the dead, thou shall be saved. Folks, I want to tell you something. You take the gospel any other shape or form without the death, the burial, and the resurrection, you're not saved. Folks, He's the only way. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. And I really wouldn't respect God if there was a way. Because I want to tell you something. To put His lovely Son through what He went through, and the awful, horrible scourge, and the awful death, the awful humiliation, if there is another way, why did, G, why did God send His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life? 
If baptizing baptizing would save you, why did Jesus have to go through that? If religion would save you, why why did Jesus have to go through that? I don't respect God if there's another way. But I do respect God because there is no other way. It's the gospel that saves us. There's There's not a way, He's the way. There's not a truth, he's the truth. You say, you're awful narrow-minded. Yes, I am. I'm so narrow-minded, a mosquito can land on my nose and kick both eyeballs out. That's pretty narrow-minded, say amen. But I'm not narrow-minded and stubborn just because I came from South Georgia. I'm I'm narrow-minded because this Bible's narrow-minded. And this Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God and that Jesus died and that Jesus was buried and that Jesus arose from the dead. And that you can be saved and stand by that. Woo! You receive it by faith. And then I see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 a testimony, a good testimony. A testimony of a man named Paul. And in this testimony he said, after that he was seen of James, then of apostle. Look at verse 8 though. And last of all, he was seen of me. <laughs> He saw him on the road to Damascus, say, man. He's making havoc of the church. And he just saw Stephen get stoned in a pit. And he didn't have the look of hell on his face. He had the look of heaven. Hallelujah. And Jesus, and, and, and he stood up and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I wonder where he got that from. And praise God, he looked at the, uh, the glow of heaven upon a man that was dying for the faith. That was being beat to a pulp? No, that was being stoned in a pit with large boulders crushing his skull, crushing his body. The life blood was flowing out of his mouth, probably in his wounds. And he stood up and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit and forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And thank God Paul was watching on. He was holding his cloak. And he said, wait a minute. This death, burial, and resurrection, it must be real. Why is that man down in that pole being stoned to death for a lie, for a theory? And folks, he said this, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He says, for I was saved, I was terrible. For I was saved, I killed Christians in the name of my religion, Phariseeism. I made havoc of the church. I made women widows and I made children orphans. In the name of my God. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. But look at this. He gets off that apostleship and he says in verse 10. Boy, this is wonderful. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach and so we believe. (laughs) Amen. He's saying, let me just give a word of testimony. I don't deserve to be called apostle, but I saw him too. And I received him. And I got off the road to Damascus and got on the road to preaching. And I turned from a persecutor to a preacher. I turned from a murderer to a missionary. Turn from lost and undone in them own sins. By the grace of God, wrote most of the New Testament. I have this testimony and wrote this beautiful book. But I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, folks, you can get all the evidence you want, but I want to tell you something. Change lives, say it all. It's not sincerity, it's not service, it's not sacraments, and it's not ordinances. It's the gospel that saves you. And through the gospel, you're saved from the penalty, the death. You're saved from the power, the burial. and You're saved from even the presence of sin one day, praise God, the resurrection. And One day I'm going to be in a place where there is no sin. And folks, if you're not saved, look at verse 17. This is my last verse. It says, and if Christ be not raised, raised, your faith is vain and you're yet in your sin. That means you've got to pay your own debt, sir, ma'am. You've got to pay your own debt. And the trouble is, keeping the Ten Commandments, you can't do it. You'll break one of them. Probably broke one today. Being religious, it was not enough. Good works, not enough. There's not a ladder to heaven, there's a cross. There's not some line of, 
of ordinances and some line of sacraments and some line of rules. There's a lamb. There's a lamb. There's a lamb that paved the way through his blood. And if you don't receive that, you'll be yet in your sins. So here's the good news. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. And the good news is you can believe in your heart that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he arose. And thank God he's coming again. The Bible says it like this in John 5, 24. You pass from death unto life. That's a resurrection. When you get saved, it's literally a personal resurrection. You get born again. You get born from above. You get saved, saved, saved. Saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the power of sin. And thank God one day, saved from the presence of sin. So the bad news is, you can't pay it. The bad news is, we're all sinners. But the good news is, Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again. Let's pray. Father, thank You. i got so much more I'd like to share. I'll do it tonight. I pray some people will come back. But I thank You, dear God, for the blessed truth of the Word of God. I could have showed hundreds of prophecy that's been fulfilled about the death, the burial, the resurrection, the birth, the ascension, all of Jesus' life. They came, came true exactly to the minute detail. And Lord, I know that this gospel is scriptural, but it's solemnly proven by people like Paul. And by 500, by the 12, by James and by Peter, they saw him. They heard him after the resurrection. Oh God, please help everyone here know for sure that they have received the finished, sufficient, final work of Jesus on the cross. An offering for their sin can be received by faith today. And we'll praise you for it. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I never preach unless I give an invitation. Preach the same message in jail Tuesday. The white he's seeing, a little boy. Only preached the three, but one of those little boys got saved. 15-year-old from Tallapoosa, Georgia. Hallelujah. Boy, he was so glad he got saved. So I'm going to go home and tell my grandmama that I live with because my parents don't even, want it, don't even want me. I'm going to tell my grandmother her prayers have been answered. I just got saved, preacher. I just got saved. Folks, I want to tell you something. You don't have to go to jail to get saved. God sets up an amazing situation like church on Easter for us to hear the gospel. The powerful message of the gospel, which the Bible says is a power unto salvation to everyone, to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile, whosoever will. You say, preach, I know I'm saved. I've truly received the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've received Jesus as my personal Savior. I know I'm saved. Would you slip your hand up as a happy testimony? That nobody's looking. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's going to approach you. We want to do the most we can do for you. We pray for you. How many glad you saved? Say amen. amen. Save, save, save. Past tense, present tense, and future tense. Say, several cannot raise your hand. You say, preacher, I've never received this good news that you preached about, and I need to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I thought it was religion. I thought it was my goodness should outweigh my my badness, my sin. No, it's all by the payment of Calvary. And you say, preacher, I've never received that good news the gospel, but I'd like to and I want you to pray for me. I won't come to you, won't embarrass you. I want to do the most I can do for you in this closing prayer. I want to pray for you. Would you slip your hand up real high for prayer and then back down and say, Preacher, pray for me. I didn't know it was that simple. I didn't know it could be that clear. Yes, it is. The gospel is so simple. The death, burial, and resurrection. Anyone? Just slip your hand up then back down. Say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Do you think enough of your own soul to say, please pray for me? I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Would you slip your hand up, then back down? I promise you, we won't come and approach you. We won't embarrass you. We won't do the most we can do for you. We won't pray for you. You could not raise your hand, but you'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. Anyone? Christians are praying. Anyone? I preach for response to God, not me. 
How many say, preacher? I'm saved. But I don't yield enough to the resurrection power in, me, in my life. The greatness of God's power in my life. And I want to be more yielded, but I also want to take the good news to a lost and dying world. And I want to tell you something. When they heard that he was alive, those ladies ran to the disciples. And those disciples ran to the tomb. And then he said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the nations and preach the death, burial, resurrection. And he said, preacher, I have many loved ones. I have many neighbors. I have many workmates that are not saved. And I want them to see the resurrected Lord through my life. Like Paul saw, saw Stephen, I want to have a testimony, even in suffering, of faithfulness. Would you slip your hand up high for prayer that you want the power of the resurrection in your life for a lost and dying world? All over this place. Thank God for you. Lord, thank you for the 